Lord, my boss will not leave me alone. Either change him or give me a new job. Lord, let Jenny notice. God, thank you so much that I'm not like them. God, please don't let me be pregnant. I didn't even God, know him. God, help Rick understand how wrong he is. God, I deserve a husband Would soon. Would you please make that neighbor's dog shut Lord, up? Lord, just give me a good parking space. If you let me win this lottery, Lord, if you just give me an A on this exam, I promise God, I God, if you take away my guilt this morning, I promise that will be the last time. God, I need your help. God, if there is more to life than what I know, please show me. Lord, help me remember that it's your money and not my money. God, help me be patient with my friends. Father, help me to realize my pride. God, please, God, Lord, help me to understand how to be a better husband. Please Father, please help, 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 help me to work hard for you. Help me be more like you. Well, good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning here at the Launceston Salvation Army. And if you're joining us online, we welcome you this morning. This will be our last week, hopefully. Uh, God willing that uh, we'll have to meet this way. We can uh, also have people with us joining us in the congregation next week. So a big hallelujah to that one. But of course, we'll still have our online service available for all those who would like to join us in that way. I was reminded this week, um, through some medical tests I had to have, uh, nothing serious, fortunately, um, but I was reminded that it's so easy to become anxious about the things that surround us. We're living in unprecedented times, aren't we? Difficult days. And although we feel we're doing okay, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're not. And, you know, I was just reminded this week that it's so important to take our worries and our anxieties to the Lord. And I've got a verse from Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I just take sort of um, comfort in those words and that reminder. We're going to share in a, a great song this morning, um, uplifting one, Build Your Kingdom Here. Come set your ruler around. Thank you. 
got a little bit lost in our words but um, that's okay we're going to share now in a chorus that um, the, I think the songsters introduced to us here at Launceston but we fall down just join us as we sing this prayerfully together to Jesus and fell at his feet um, and she cried, wept tears to wash his feet and she wiped them with her hair. I wonder if that's how we would greet Jesus, how we would meet him. Um, just, yeah, it's just beautiful uh, to sing those words. We're now going to share in a time of prayer and um, of course we've had on our hearts the great concerns that um, are happening in Victoria around the coronavirus. And 
we just thought this morning, if we took some time to pray about these uh, things as they are unfolding, um, just to take it to the feet of Jesus. And Warren's going to just open our time of prayer as we think on these things. So just where you are, quiet in your hearts. And I would ask you to consider these prayers and pray with me as I pray. Well, Heavenly Father, there is much to pray about in these days. We see much calamity and upset in the world. And Heavenly Father, people struggle with enduring in these days. And so, Father, we would ask and pray that you would help people to follow the instructions that are given. As frustrated as they may be, that you would break through them and that you would make available to, him, to them the strength that they need to follow those instructions. Heavenly Father, we pray too that we would see a slowing of the number of cases and that the deaths in Australia will be minimised as much as possible. Heavenly Father, we see a continual growing and we would ask that you would continue to be in all circumstances, that you would be with those who are succumbing to the virus, those who would grieve over deaths. Heavenly Father, we pray too for medical and other frontline workers, including the Australian Defence Force on the front line in Victoria. And Heavenly Father, for all of those frontline workers, we would ask that you would give them the endurance that they need, that they would have the wherewithal. We know, Lord, that um, if this continues on the curve that it's on, that they will be pushed to breaking. And so, Father, rally those around who have the capability, strength and wisdom to come in and support them in these days. We ask in Jesus' name. And as we continue in prayer, dear Heavenly Father, our, our hearts and our minds turn to the Salvation Army Emergency Services workers and all that they're asked to do as they present alongside others just to provide food provisions and Nothing. spiritual support. Lord, we just pray that you will sustain them and that they will know that we prayerfully cover them uh, with our supporting prayers, Lord, and that you give them the words and the strength and the encouragement that they need just to come alongside people and to provide for the practical needs of the people there in Victoria. And we particularly, Lord, think of the leaders in that state. We think of Daniel Andrews, the, the Premier, and other state leaders, and our Prime Minister indeed, Lord Scott Morrison. We just pray that there will be continued wisdom for them and that they look to you, Lord, for um, the wise decisions and, and the um, things that they need to just deliberate over. We just pray that your guidance will be with them and that um, they will be convicted in this time of leadership. Such a challenging time for so many, Lord. Lord, we just pray that um, the people of Victoria will feel your presence among them and that they will know that we're praying for them and, and just uh, uh, praying on their behalf as they go through this challenging time. So we pray this in your name. Amen. And amen. And I know your thoughts and your hearts will be with them uh, as they go through this time together. Uh, so we have some announcements, and I guess the major announcement for the Launceston Corps is that we will be able to meet together next week. So that's very exciting. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm really missing seeing some of the people that uh, we normally can gather together with on a Sunday. So uh, I believe that uh, well, Roderick and Kelly have sent out some um, just guidelines around how that will happen. 
Uh, so I just encourage you to read those. And if you haven't re received them, please let us know. Um, give us a call here and uh, we can sort that out for you. But we're really looking forward to meeting together in this place uh, together next Sunday. Meredith is now going to bring a, a beautiful selection as we just contemplate uh, our giving to the Lord. And I just uh, pray that you'll be with her as she presents that this morning. Thank you, Meredith, for that reminder. To God be the glory for the things he has done. And he has provided so much in our lives, hasn't he? And it's great to be reminded of that. Bef um, we're going to sing again just before um, we watch a small clip and, and then Warren is going to bring the message to us this morning. And we're going to share the song, The Potter's Hand. Um, I don't know about you, but I know in our lives we go through challenging times. And I don't think any of us are um, protected from that. It is part of uh, living in this world. But, you know, I believe the real shaping of us in our spiritual journey is when we do go through those times. Uh, as difficult and as hurtful and painful as they can be. And, you know, the Lord, sometimes we need to be broken by our Heavenly Father so that we can be used for him. And um, this song just reminds us of that. And I believe Warren will just be bringing um, a message around that this morning. So let's share this beautiful song, The Potter's Hand.
Father, we just are brought into your presence here this morning, Lord, and thank you for that reminder that you are our guide, you are our lead, and Lord, we just need to put our trust in you. So Heavenly Father, we just pray for your message this morning as we just listen to the words that you have given to Warren. Lord, we just pray that our hearts will be moved and that we will be encouraged to just lean into you more and more, Lord, that we may be prepared to be broken by you, Lord, so that we can be used as an offering. Lord, we just pray that you'll be each with each and every one of us in these days as we just reach out to those that need you most. Pray this in your name. Amen. After the resurrection of Jesus, many people became believers and were baptized. One such person was Stephen. He was full of God's grace and power. When he preached, people listened. He was speaking wisdom, healing the sick, performing miracles, and proving the power of Christ among the people. Every day, Stephen would go into public places and tell people about Jesus. Some of the leaders and Pharisees were not happy about this. One such Pharisee was named Saul. He hated Christians and wanted to destroy them. Every day, the religious leaders looked for an opportunity to arrest Stephen. As more and more people started to believe in Jesus, the religious leaders knew they were running out of time. Some of them decided to make up lies about Stephen, spreading rumors that he was saying bad things about God this was called blasphemy and was the perfect accusation to get rid of Stephen. One day, while Stephen was still preaching, they grabbed him and brought him before the religious council. Their evil plan finally succeeded. Stephen was dragged into court where false witnesses said, this man is saying bad things about our holy temple and the law. He is saying that Jesus will destroy the temple. He's saying that Jesus has changed the laws. What do you have to say for yourself? The leaders demanded. As Stephen began to speak, the Holy Spirit came upon him and his face started to glow. Listen to me, said Stephen. Everyone quieted down as the angel-like man began to talk. He told them all about their country's great history their sad disobedience, and how Jesus came to change it all. In telling the story, he had to tell them about their own sin and evils. They did not like this at all. They became so angry that they decided to kill him. They seized Stephen and dragged him outside the city walls. They picked up stones and started to throw them at him. As the stones fell onto Stephen's body, breaking his bones and bruising his flesh, he did not stop praying. Instead, he continued to preach about Jesus. As he died, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. One man standing there was Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee who later would become the Apostle Paul. Saul, at that time, wanted to do everything to stop people from believing in Jesus. Later on, Jesus would appear to Saul, and Saul would himself become a believer. The microphone, because I had to change microphone. Um, things were conspiring against me this morning. But... An interesting video. The video we just watched about Stephen was telling the story that we can read in Acts 6 8 through to 760, which is a fairly long story, a long passage of scripture, but it's an important story. When you have time, I think you could get much from reading this story. And last week, I did it a number of times as I read different translations and I watched video presentations. You see, Roderick asked me to speak on this scripture in the context of what he and Colonel Ian have been talking about and teaching on in recent weeks. 
Colonel Ian even referenced this story last week as one of the many examples of good Bible stories that help us understand about God's purpose in sending Jesus as an atonement, or as often as I say it, an at one that we would be at one with God and his plan and purpose for us. Stephen is the man that I feel I, in my humanness, could never be. And for a lot, of, a lot of us, I'm sure, that while we can admire all that he did, we may not possess the character and bravery to do what he did. I have been and still am bold for Christ, but would I risk community persecution and face death? Why did he persevere even to the point of his own destruction? And what was the secret to his unswerving faith and obedience? In this scripture passage, it is laid clear what his secret was. And in verse 8 of chapter 6, it starts the story with Stephen, the man so full of faith and the Holy Spirit's power, And so he spoke with authority. When I was in the regular army, I was taught how to speak with authority and the need to stand in your own authority. And my wife sometimes is subjected to that. I must admit it is easier to stand in your own authority if your commanding officer or your wife is standing behind you nodding her head in agreement. That could be why the politicians have those people standing behind them at press conferences, nodding agreement with all that they say. Well, look at this picture. Because God can stand behind us and he nods when we speak for him and he guides us and he cares about us. He gives direction and sometimes we even feel that hand on our shoulder as we speak out for him. So back to Stephen. He not only stood on his own authority, but he had the authority of God within him through his faith and trust empowered by the Holy Spirit. He was present for God and he spoke up. And because of his obedience to the Spirit's leading and the knowledge imparted to him through the Holy Spirit, the Jewish factions and leaders and the council that he was before couldn't dispute or refute his teaching. In verse 10, it says, but none of them was able to stand against Stephen's wisdom and spirit. And so, as is common in these situations, they plotted against him, made up stories that twisted what he said to sound like blasphemy, and did all they could to defame him. But listen what happens when he was brought before the church leaders in the temple, in verse 14. They declared, We have heard him say that this fellow, Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy the temple and throw out all of Moses' law. At this point, everyone in the council chamber saw Stephen's face become as radiant as an angel's. That's an amazing picture to think about, isn't it? He was so present for God that God was present in him. It reminds me of all those other scriptures that say, and the glory of God was upon them and was about them. If you have an electronic Bible, just go and have a look at how often in the Old Testament that statement, and the glory of God, was used. And how often it preceded the Jewish people being given a chance to turn from their ways and they are blind to it. Stephen then went on to admonish the Jewish leaders for how they had continually treated God, reminding them of all the prophets God had had to send to them to lead them back to their faith in God and how they had created laws and traditions that were not of God but of man. 
and in some cases were about the other gods that they had favoured from time to time. How the glory of God was present with them, sometimes filling the tabernacle like a cloud and yet they still turned to their other gods. He had lots of stories to tell because the Old Testament's full of those stories. And then after that lengthy reminder of all their past failings, he summed it up in chapter 7 and in verses 51 to 53, where he says, You stiff-necked heathen, must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? But your fathers did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the one, the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah, whom you betrayed and murdered as well. Yes, and you deliberately destroyed God's law, though you received them from the hands of angels. So they had every reason to believe and they took every excuse not to. You can understand perhaps why they felt a little bit angry towards him. How would we respond as a church if our general came and said something like that to us? I hope it would be the same way we have responded to our state leaders call to us to repent and be reconciled to God. We would accept it as a way forward in the path of Christ's plan for his church in this place. The Holy Spirit fills the void left when we cast out sin and self. How many times have we heard Major Jude remind us, less of me, more of you, God. And so if we want more of the Spirit's power, we need to let go of self. Let go of tradition, distraction and self-rule. Let go of the past, acknowledge and embrace the forgiveness of sins and daily invite a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit for direction, for understanding and that indwelling presence and authority of the Lord will be ours. Back to Stephen. So as they grabbed him, he described visions he was having of the heavens opening above them and Jesus standing at the right of God with the gate open to them. And even as they stoned him, he lifted prayers of praise to God and asked God to forgive what they were doing. His faith helped him endure and continue to witness for Christ. There were two critical outcomes of this event. One of them was mentioned at the end of the video. Firstly, one of those that was there to witness all this was Saul of Tarsus, who later changed from a persecutor of the faithful to be the Apostle Paul, defender of the faith. Secondly, the violence continued. And that caused the church to disperse and leave Jerusalem because they all feared for their lives. But in doing so, they scattered across the land and they spread and grew the church. Sometimes we don't know what God's plan is and why things happen, do we? Until much later. Stephen's witness was not for naught. So Stephen imparted the message for the church. But what's the message for us as members of the church today? Well, I found this slide and thought it was great. God calls us to be present, not to just be there. When we are present, we are able to, uh, he is able to use us in extraordinary ways. I don't know how many times, if you're like me, you've gone to training and sometimes it takes you a while to be present in the room. There's so many other things going on in your mind. Well, the Lord wants us, 
when we're being his witnesses to be present when we are there to be present as ambassadors for Christ we need to be present where and as God wants us Stephen warned the council that they had become keepers of the church law and not necessarily God's law they had been misshapen from what God had intended them to be and a church in a building and not lived out with faith in the community. God is not constrained to a place in church. He is in the world all around us and in us and our lives should always be an act of worship, living out the Saviour's character in the world so that we are not just known to be saved to serve, but we are seen to serve and save without reserve and for the whosoever. God's rule and plan should be your guide. Seek to shape the church where it fulfills God's plan and purpose in this place. How do we want to go ahead? We want to transform lives and communities. That's what our motto says. Be God-honouring and don't, don't seek the honour or approval of the world because you won't always get it. I'm sure many have seen what's going on on um, social media about our handling of the bushfire funds. And I cry almost as I see the negativity of some people about the efforts that we've put in place to try and help those people. But we're not there for the support and the kind words of those people. We are there for those people that have been affected, that need our servanthood as God would direct us. So, what's all this mean? God made you what you are. The Bible tells us about a man named Gideon who thought he was not important. He was hiding from the enemy that had invaded his country and when Gideon had given up all hope for his people, God sent an angel to encourage him. The angel had this message for him from Judges 6.12. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. God didn't evaluate Gideon by his fear or his insecurity. Instead, God saw Gideon's potential in helping his people. I'm sure sometimes we feel like that. We have fear and insecurities about what God is asking us to do. But God sees the warrior in us. God saw Gideon as a warrior, not as a coward. People soon knew that the Lord was with Gideon for he behaved differently. He transformed through the indwelling of the Spirit and under the direction of the God he so loved. Think of Gideon and take courage. You may not feel important, but you are in God's eyes very important. Because you are someone to him, he wants you to behave differently. Be a new and changed person. Next, you are somebody. You are a child of God. What happened to you when you became a Christian? You repented of your sins and God forgave you. You were saved because you asked Jesus Christ to become the Saviour and Lord of your life. You believed in him as the Son of God and received him into your heart to rule over your life. Is that your experience? You are a born-again child of God. Or perhaps it's time to revisit that commitment. God's forgiveness continues as we continue to strive for him. God never gives up on us. Next, God has done a work in you. The Gospel of John tells us what a wonderful thing takes place when people receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. 
Listen to these verses carefully. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. Great words from John 1, 12 and 13. Was this only for those who lived at the time of Jesus? No, of course not. To be born again is the right and experience of all who have ever believed and received Jesus. We are made new through the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of God within us. In a special way, God has given life to you. It is not a new physical life, as much as some of us would want that. No one can go back to being a baby. As much as Sam, your dad, might say that sometimes, it doesn't happen. You can't go back to being a baby. It is a new spiritual life, which God himself brings into being. He is the father of all who are born again. Can you imagine how important that makes you? You really are someone. You are a child of the almighty God. The creator of the universe is your father. Next, there is a purpose for you as his child. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Those words are from Ephesians 2 and verse 10. The purpose of God for his children includes a life of good deeds. Good deeds means doing what is good and right in all things. We should use all our time and talents to be the best we can become a living testimony to the transforming and enabling power of God. However, good deeds alone cannot make anyone a Christian. Once a person becomes a child of God, they must also live according to God's standard. A child of God is different and acts differently from people who are not Christians. Christians show their faith by doing new things for God. This is the message of James 1, verses 22 to 25. Read those verses because it reminds us that faith, faith has to show itself in action. God wants his children to be holy and without fault. God can help believers change their attitude. I remember that transformation for me where I was able to change the way I looked at people. I used to look at people and judge them in the past. But now the Lord has lifted those scales off my eyes and I'm able to look at them in a different way. I see the Christ potential in them and I want to try my hardest to draw that out. And that's how we must look at people. Take off the judgment. The Lord doesn't judge us anymore. Take it off. Attitudes are the way we feel about people and things. I'm sure you've all seen those um, insurance ads that are on at the moment where they show someone and you've got to try and guess what their occupation and circumstances are. We're not very good at it, are we? Let's look at them with the eyes of Christ. Our attitude shows what we are like. So when God saves us, he changes our inner life. Then our new life produces godly attitudes and actions. We react differently. Next, God has placed you in a family. God has many sons and daughters, the Christians who form the family of God. Our Father wants his family to be a united group. Unity is wonderful. But not, God didn't make Christians one body just to have a unit. The Salvation Army didn't raise us up just because they wanted a core. A soccer coach does not collect players just to say that he has a team. 
He unifies them to play. God has a purpose for our church and for the body of Christ and you have a part to play in it. And we don't have spectators. <laughs> Everyone's a player. It's just that it might be sitting on the bench a bit at the minute. Next, there is a purpose for you in the family. We all need to take part in the spiritual life of God's family. The writer to the Hebrews puts the physical, emotional and spiritual needs all together when he says in Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the end days approaching. We've been fortunate, haven't we, that the web has allowed us to continue to meet together in this way. That uh, we've been able to open our doors to the coffee shop and meet with people of the community over breakfast and an evening meal. And why do we do that? Because the next one is that you are an ambassador of the kingdom. What would happen to a family that did not grow? Families are meant to increase in number. When God created the first human beings, he told them to increase the family. God wants the same for his spiritual family. He wants more and more people to be born again into his family. Jesus said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure we all remember those words from Matthew 28 and verse 19. God's body of believers must grow and each member has a share in this process. You are commanded to help by doing your best to bring more believers into God's family. And there's a myriad of ways we can do that, not just the physical ones. There is many many of my aunties that prayed people into the kingdom of God and next God has left you in the world all of the problems of money and work did not suddenly disappear when you were born again your neighbours and fellow workers did not suddenly become more friendly and helpful why not? you were still left in this world and here things are not always easy. Problems are mixed with joys. You may have harder decisions to make than before because now you're a Christian. <laughs> Your family and friends may not understand you. And why is all this? Because the devil is against you now. He doesn't want God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. But consider Jesus' prayer to God for his disciples as his prayer for each and every one of you. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. As you send me into the world... I have sent them into the world. Great words from John 17. If God wants his children in the world, you can be sure there is a good reason. So what is our purpose? What is the purpose for you in the world? Some Christians would like to separate themselves from the world. But you are an ambassador. You represent the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul expressed this idea, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That comes from 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. 
God's purpose is for you to speak for Christ. God sends you to show and tell people that he loves them and wants to give them new life. What privilege could be greater? What responsibility responsibility could be more challenging? What activity places a greater demand on you in terms of practising your new life? Because it's not good enough just to say it. You have to live it. God's purpose for you is a high one. No one by his or her own power can fulfil it. But you are born again by the Spirit of God and he lives in you to help you do what you could not do before. The Holy Spirit helps you live out your new nature in attitudes and actions worthy of God, worthy of a child of God. But you have to let him help you. And you do that by doing what he tells you. How often do you hear those promptings and say, not me, Lord, not just now. Do your best to present yourself to God as one who has been approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. They're words of scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 2. As building stones of God's church, be clay that is moulded into a brick, the shape of which is influenced by the mould and also by the structure. We sang that song, The Potter's Hand. It came to me numerous times as I was preparing this. The church influenced and shaped people and Stephen reminded them that they had to get into shape the one God had planned for them, that shape, not the one they had planned for themselves. I've often said it before. It's not, bless what I do for God. It should actually be, what I do for God, I want to do that you would bless me, God. I want to be in God's will. I don't want to impress my will on God and ask him to bless it. No traditional building stones, uh, not traditional building stones as perhaps the church or the world would see us, but as God would see us. Born again into new stone, break me, mould me, fill me. And in some of the reading I did this week, it said that when you fill me, fill me with the elements of God. Remove the man made and perfect me in the way of God. Release in me the gifts that fulfill God's purpose for me. Be the stone or solid rock of which the church is built on, the foundation stone of Christ Jesus. But be a rolling stone, not the band. (laughs) Be a rolling stone. In other words, willing to be firm and present for Christ anywhere in your community. Don't be fixed in one spot. And the last slide. The lack of being present creates lost opportunity. Today, be present and allow God to use you. Always be present. The band are going to come up and lead us in a song. And I would ask that you surrender yourself into the hands of God today. That you would be freshly infilled, empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit. And marked present at all times by God. As we sing this chorus, All to Jesus I surrender. I want you to reflect. Are you still the building block that God shaped you to be? That this church would grow in and transform community?
are you still the right shape? Or have you allowed other things to shape you and influence you? When we surrender ourselves to God, he does exactly that. He does what we said before. He breaks us and he remoulds us into the shape we need to be. I would ask that if you make that decision today to surrender all to God, that you acknowledge your decision and come to join with us in worship here next week because the doors will be open. Or you can pop in during the week for a chat about your journey and your decision. There will be people here who can speak with you. So as we sing, I would ask that you would pray and contemplate these words from today.
let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because we know that when we surrender our all to you, that we become children of God with a great inheritance and an indwelling power that helps us to succeed even in this sinful world. So Father, I would pray today that if there are those that have made a decision today, whether it be a new decision to follow Christ or they have renewed their decision to be Christ-like in this world, that you would bless them into this week for those that persevere in your service in these trying times, Lord, we would ask that you would give them that extra strength they need in this week. And Heavenly Father, for the nation of Australia, for the people in this world who are suffering as a consequence of this pandemic, we would ask for an extra special dispensation of your grace, peace, love and healing in these days and for our benediction now may spirit and word be forever married in our experience may the heat of joy and the light of truth burn in our hearts and may we who with unveiled faces behold the glory of Christ become increasingly transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ make us gracious. The love of God our Father make us loving. And the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit fill and empower us until we show in our lives more of the Spirit and the character of Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we go out this morning... Let's uh, conclude with the lovely song, 10,000 Reasons. May we have a faith like Stephen's, that whatever may pass, whatever may lay before us, that we will remain faithful to him.
Amen.